clap your hands. You can get back on your feet. Come on, everybody. Hands up. Hands up. It's time. It's time to step the atmosphere. Our hearts cry. Our hearts cry. We need. We need to feel your presence here. We stand. We stand. In all. In all of all your majesty. Your kingdom. Your kingdom reigns in victory. I read your bio and it's okay. amazingly impressive. And um, oh. so I want to just give a, a introduction uh, to my audience. Okay. And I've um, created this new platform called Music Motivation and Ministry. And what, what I'm doing at this point as a person who is a musician, a worship artist, motivational speaker, but most of all, a minister. And um, I enjoy seeing people who share their faith, who share their truth, and especially uh, Black people who are walking in those things. And so I celebrate mm -hmm. you for what you're doing. Um, so everybody, welcome to the Music, Motivation, and Ministry podcast. I'm your host, The Real J Shep. And today I have someone who I've known for, goodness gracious, close to 30 years. It's scary. Yeah. It's scary uh, saying something <laughs> like that, even though some people will say, y'all don't even look 30, but it's all good. Um, <laughs> so Dr. Amber Brooks, I'm going to just read a few key points in her bio. She's a board certified anesthesiologist, also comprehensive pain medicine physician, associate professor of anesthesiology at Wake Forest Baptist Hospital. She's a wife and mother to a woman of faith and a strong voice for change in the black community. So mm -hmm. I thank you, my friend, Amber, for joining. So what have you been up to the past 20 years? <laughs> well, first of all, Jason, thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this discussion. Um, and thank goodness for social media so that we could um, follow one another's lives over the years. And so I'm so proud of all of the things that you've been doing. And your um, ministry and yeah. in your faith walk and using your music to touch people. So again, thank you so, so much for having me. Yeah. Um, what have I been doing? I mean, late as of late for these last few months, you know, I think just trying to adjust to this new normal mm -hmm. um, with regards to kind of this double pandemic that we're in, right. Having to deal with COVID, especially being a, a healthcare worker who's mm -hmm. on the front lines and then also dealing with the added layer of recent race, racial injustices and just trying to figure out what my what God really wants me to do um, to use my platform to help affect change. So you mentioned that you've been on the front line um, during this pandemic. What are some of the things that you've seen and experienced being a, a frontline worker? Um, and what have you had to grapple with during this whole time? So, you know, I think that, um, you know, I think I, I, I'm, I try to be a person who looks at things through the lens of glass half full and to be optimistic. And so some of the things that I'm really proud of is to see ways in which uh, the community has come together to make sure that we're taking still taking good care of our patients uh, and also still protecting everyone um, from the real threat of coronavirus. This is not a hoax <laughs> when right. 100,000 people die in in the matter of months this isn't this isn't a hoax it's very real and it's especially very real for those of us who are in healthcare who are putting our lives on the line um, one of the major concerns especially in the beginning was just making sure 
that everyone in my family would be safe. Uh, fortunately for me, as a pain medicine physician, in the beginning when COVID hit, many um, of our patients, we were still able to see via telehealth, so either video visits or phone visits, which for my workplace was relatively new. And so that was important. And I think with regards to expanding care for people, it will be a component, it will, it will remain a component of the way that we still reach out to people. So again, I think in all of this, I try to, I try to you know, see the positive and, um, and try to stay, try to stay safe and encourage other people, especially in the black community, that right. this is, that this is real. And it's funny you say that, like, I like the fact that you put this, you reemphasize, this is not a hoax. Because in the beginning, right, I can still remember back in February when I was just like, mm -hmm. we've been through swine flu, man, we've been through such and <laughs> such. They said this was going to mm -hmm. happen, they said that was going to happen. And so I don't know if we necessarily, or uh, speaking for myself, if I thought it was a hoax or more so something that was being blown way over the top out of proportion. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it was somewhere right. in between, you know, I'm like, okay, it's, it's definitely real, but right. let's, let's be serious people like shut the whole world down. That's not, that's not going to happen, mm -hmm. you know? And so right. maybe that's somewhat of our naivete or a little bit of arrogance mm -hmm. as quote unquote Americans, but how has this, well, even, yeah. Go ahead. Well, just, you know, yeah, just to make a point, I mean, even in the beginning, I think there were um, healthcare workers, including myself, that really felt like back in February, that the real threat at that time was still influenza. So we were preaching, like, if you haven't gotten your flu shot, like, get your flu shot. We really still thought that flu was the, was the major threat. And wow. now, you know, a couple of months in, we've actually seen more deaths secondary to coronavirus than we have the flu. So I think in the beginning, there was, there was definitely uncertainty as to what the impact was going to be. Nobody, nobody could have predicted that. What are the numbers looking like um, where you are in North Carolina? What, what is it? Um, Cause you know, in California, different States, it's just looking different. And, you know, sometimes right. the numbers are, skewed or play with in a certain way now some of that is a game i don't know what the game is i don't know what the end game is but what are the what are the numbers looking like out where you are in north carolina right so the numbers in my part of north carolina have increased over the past few weeks uh, as we entered phase two of our um you know re-engagement with one another um, some of the guidelines around um, the way that we that the way that we move around the community have been lifted, and so not surprisingly, we have seen an increase in cases. The social distance the social distancing rules were never designed to eradicate coronavirus. We don't have a cure, and we don't have a vaccination, and so those social distancing guidelines were never meant to do away with coronavirus. Instead, they were meant to control the number of cases and illnesses secondary to coronavirus that we were going to see in our hospitals. So in other words, we didn't want to overwhelm our healthcare workers. And we wanted to make sure that we had proper supplies like ventilators or breathing machines to make sure that we could take care of people. So that was to be expected. Our major, um, the drive, the two major drivers of cases in our area are twofold. We have a Tyson, um, chick, a Tyson meat packing plant that's not too far from where I am, um, and it employs uh, employs several thousand people, and so that has been a big, big source of the outbreak. And then number two, we have clusters of nursing home facilities that have seen outbreaks. So. Um, we're fortunate. We've not seen any in this area of North Carolina. We have not seen anything like what other states like New York have seen. 
and our overall community prevalence has remained pretty, pretty low. That's good. And because when you think about, you know, North Carolina in comparison to a New York or Chicago, people are spread out as it is. You know, you have your house and your neighbor is not like right next to you. You got a yard, you can, you know, whereas in New York, everybody's stacked up. You're riding elevators, you're riding subways, um, you know, you're just close and you're bumping to people and people are talking in your space and they're all up on you. Right. Um, and so just even seeing how that um, spread so fast, uh, it was just, I, I thought about the movie Outbreak. I'm not, I'm not sure if you saw that movie, mm -hmm. not Outbreak, uh, excuse me. Um, what was the other movie? Uh, oh my goodness, it's slipping my mind. I know I cannot help you. I don't watch a whole lot of movies, so <laughs> I am of, I am of no help. And my oh husband my is always like, my husband is always making fun of me. He's like, you haven't seen that movie? And I'm like, nope. It was a movie that came <laughs> out a few years ago with, um, oh my goodness. It's going to come to me in a couple minutes. But this movie, oh, basically, no the, the movie basically was like a bat a bat bites a pig right in a in a wet market and a chef cooks the pig wipes his hands on his apron and shakes hands with somebody from america mm -hmm. and then this um this basically this super bug ends up spreading contagion that's the movie the movie Contagion. Okay. So yeah, I've heard of it. It it causes this global pandemic, and so mm -hmm. every time I think about the movie Contagion, like when I saw that movie, I left there like, this is messed up. And if anything like this ever happens, I don't know what I would do. <laughs> and so now we're right. in the middle of that. Um, but on the let's kind of like shift a little bit to more yeah. of the 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 personal side on how you've been dealing with it rather than just the medical mm -hmm. side. Um, mm -hmm. Wife and mother, you have two, two little beautiful girls. You know, we have two children. Oh, well. Thank you. How has this been this adjustment with doing e-learning kids mm -hmm. being at home, eating up all the food, uh, always <laughs> need to go somewhere, you know, how has that adjustment been in your life? Yeah, so it's definitely been challenging for me because I have never, but prior to COVID, I was never a big work from home person. I was always used to going into clinic or going into the hospital or going into my work office. And so all of that shifted a couple of months ago. I am very, very, very fortunate and very blessed to have a mother-in-law who is retired. And so during the thick of e-learning, she basically moved in with us for two months to help us with the e-learning of our older child, which really, really helped tremendously. Um, one of the things that my husband and I um, had to talk about was, you know, the lack of socialization for my oldest who was home. She's very social. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, she just broke down into big crocodile tears. And she said, I don't want to Zoom with my friends anymore. I don't want to FaceTime them. I want to play with my friends. And so we um, had to really weigh the pros and cons of her psychological well-being and knowing that she needs some socialization and also weigh that with the, you know, with the potential risk of coronavirus and so for us and you know this this should look like you know decisions on how you want to uh, reacclimate to this new normal may look different for everybody so i'm not suggesting that everybody follow my lead but for my family we decided um that we would put her in an outdoor camp for a good chunk of the summer so this week she's in a horseback riding farm camp that's all outdoors. And then later on in the summer, she'll be participating in an outdoor YMCA camp. But we felt like that was the appropriate decision for our family and our child. 
um, when we, when we, again, when we focus on just her well-being and her need for socialization and her need to be around other children. I can, I'm her mom, but I cannot be her BFF. <laughs> Man, tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, it's just too much and try to work yeah. and yeah. try to stay, you know, productive during this time. Uh, I just, you know, I cannot, I have learned a long time ago, like I, I do not have the capacity to do this all on my own. So yeah, that was the decision that was, you know, that was best for our family. Yeah. I mean, we're in the same book. Our, our kids are, my daughter ended school last week. My son's last week of school is this week. And uh, I think it was Memorial Day. I took him out to his basketball team was playing uh, at a park. Like they were doing street ball. And I was like, don't want to do this, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. And so he's only played organized ball. So he he don't know about that street ball life. You know, <laughs> he, he, you know, but him getting out there was something that was like it was like reintroducing himself back into uh, the fold. And so, you know, slowly but surely, you know, I believe that we will get back to those things that are, quote unquote, normal. Um, so mm -hmm. I want to uh, segue a little bit because it's interesting. We both grew up in Homewood. Mm-hmm. James, James Hart. Homewood. James Hart. See, you were in your red for the Vikings. Vikings represent uh -huh. class of 97. <laughs> uh, I recently uh, had breakfast with another one of our classmates who graduated same mm. year as us about a year ago, uh, Anthony Tabor. And, yeah, Anthony. Uh, How's he doing? Anthony's good. He's real good. Um, awesome. He and his fiance, they just had a baby boy a few months ago. And then their okay. wedding got pushed back because of COVID. They were supposed to get married in Cancun. Yeah. So, but shout out to Anthony doing big things out here uh, as well. And um, I kind of share with him some things because as I got as I've gotten older, I've been able to process my time growing up in Homewood a lot better as mm -hmm. I've gotten older. Mm -hmm. Living in three of the four major large cities in the U.S., Chicago, Houston, and now L.A., I've been able to, I feel that my level of adjustment within black and white communities mm -hmm. was, was grounded in Homewood. And mm -hmm. I didn't realize some of the things that I had gone through as oftentimes the only black boy in the classroom starting at Churchill mm -hmm. School. And then as we went to James Hart, that grew. And then Home of Flossmoor, well, of course, that grew. Um, there was one incident that I that I shared. Um, haven't really shared it with a lot of people. But in, in sixth grade, uh, I had a, Mr. Drews was my teacher. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I thought Mr. Drews was a fantastic teacher at the time. Mm -hmm. But... This this thing kind of stuck with me because I used to keep my hair cut really, really short. I didn't have this big bush on my head. <laughs> and when I would get my hair cut short, Mr. Drews would say, everybody come rub Jason's hair for good luck. What? And me, not knowing any better, I'm laughing. He, he oh, I'm thinking it's funny. I'm thinking it's something right. that's like, okay. Not anything that I would I even even trigger to go home and tell my parents what he said, because right. we were living in a time. Well, first of all, we're not in a post-racial time as it is, but during right. those times in the early '90s, it wasn't even nowhere near a time where people were trying to really hide stuff. Right, and it, and it didn't trigger to me until one day I was watching an episode of All in the Family, and I saw Archie Bunker do the same thing. Mm. And then one day, I just, I felt like paralyzed. I was like, wait, all this time when I was growing up, when I was like not seeing race or even really understanding it like that. Yeah. And I'm wondering, 
because I haven't really had a lot of conversations with the people. Like, quite frankly, you know, I see people on social media. Hey, what's up? Good to see you. All love the family, blah, blah, blah. And it's all really like surface stuff. Was there yeah. anything that you experienced during that time growing up in Homewood hmm. that was like, bruh, mm -hmm. if anybody ever do that to my child, it's on site? Absolutely. So um, my experience didn't happen until, well, two experiences, two experiences I'll share with you. So, and I didn't know this first experience until I was much older when my dad finally told me. So um, I didn't move, we moved to Homewood when I was in sixth grade. Prior to that, we lived in Chicago and I went to Walt Disney Magnet School for K through five. And um, I was in um, the gifted program, accelerated program, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so when my dad went to register me at James Hart, um, they were not going to, they simply looked at the school, you know, the city public school that I had been to and made a lot of assumptions. And so based on those assumptions, um, they told my dad that they were going to start me in you know, just regular classes. And apparently, again, I did not know any of this, but my, apparently my dad um, went off on them and told them that they were going to put me in the accelerated classes and that they were going to honor my, you know, credits and progress from, from Walt Disney. Again, I didn't know that until I was much um, older, but I'm just so thankful that I had my dad uh, yes. as an advocate to stand in the gap for me. Um, I can imagine that maybe there were other children in the same predicament who were moving from the city to the suburbs um, who didn't have a parent or someone to stand in the gap for them. And, you know, maybe that out, their outcomes may not have been as positive or my, with, as mine were. So that was, that was experience number one. And again, my dad did not share that until I was much older. Yeah. Um, and so my second um, experience happened in high school. I won't name the counselor, the guidance counselor, but I was, um, I, you know, I, I was a high academic achiever in high school. I think I finished, you know, number, I don't know, in the top 30 students in our class. Um, my GPA was off the chain. Um, and so anyways, long story short, I went down and sat, sat down with, with the guidance counselor and he put a list together of schools that I had, that I should apply to, none of which included any Ivy League schools. Northwestern wasn't on there. Um, you know, it was very um, mid, mid tier to low tier um, high school or uh, colleges. And so I, again, I took that list home to my parents and my dad was so angry. He like tore the guidance school counselor's suggested list up. And he was like, how dare him? He was so upset. And that day, my dad and I, he sat down and we made the schools that I was going to apply to. And the guidance counselor had no faith that I was going to get into any of these schools. And in fact, I did. I got into every school that I applied to with the exception of two, Stanford and Georgetown. Ultimately, I ended up going to Northwestern. That's where I know your, your yep. wife from. But Here's a funny um, story. Stacy didn't get into Stanford either. And she was really? crushed because her brother went to Stanford. Yes. So uh, she still got a little thing about this whole Stanford, <laughs> you know. But I said, well, well, well I, babe, if you didn't go to Northwestern, we wouldn't have met. And so, you know. See? So we, it all, it all it worked out. Work out, yeah. But that story of guidance counselors yes. misguiding yes. African-American students is not uncommon. As I've gotten older and I've shared my stories with other friends, I've heard that story repeatedly Yes. Um, that despite having the qualifications yes. and the grades and everything that they were telling us that we weren't good enough. And I remember my dad, I remember like kind of arguing with my dad. Well, saying, well, you know, he's the expert. He's the guidance school counselor. You know, he, he knows he, yeah. he's, he's been there. This isn't. And I remember my dad like shutting all that down. Yeah. Like that man does not know anything. And knowing my dad, he probably called him and had some um, behind the scenes conversation because that's yeah. how my dad rolls. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, but again, just so happy to have my father yes. um, who, who stood in the gap for me and yes. advocated on my behalf. And it's like, no, my daughter is more than qualified to go to any school that she wants to. She's worked hard for this. It's awesome because you, you brought up you brought up a key element, right? And I'm, I'm super passionate about this because the depiction of black men in media and uh, in a lot of different spaces and places will look to um, minimalize our impact, number one, mm-hmm. and trivialize our impact. And everything has become so lean towards, well, you know, being a strong independent woman, which is amazingly important. But if you have a strong man there, a strong father, who's Mm -hmm. gonna help balance that out and say, baby girl, this man don't know better than your dad. And and as Mm -hmm. a dad who's had to go to go to war for his kids, even in this day and time, you know, my wife and I still like having, basically having it out with people who don't always see, they think they see the best for your child, but they really don't. Right. And so right. shout out to your dad for being amazing. I have an amazing father too. And, and just being able to like, and I empathize with um, individuals who haven't had their father. So what if they didn't have that person that's fighting, you know? And so even thinking about the shift that's happening in the dynamics of black America, where everybody's in this fight, I heard, um, I heard the ignorance from, from the sister, um, Candace Owens and I'm praying that God touches her her mind, body and soul. And, but the ignorance that she was spewing, about George Floyd. And it almost brought tears to my eyes because there's a thought from individuals who think they're elite, who think they're above, who think that they're never to a point where they should have grace for anyone that is quote unquote. The Bible talks about the quote unquote least of them, right? Mm-hmm. And so if we're, Absolutely. if we're in a position where we know, well, this might not be necessarily me as a man who has a criminal record, but I have an right. uncle, right? I have an uncle who's 74 or five years old. And out of those 70 some odd years of life, he spent the better part of 30 years in jail for various reasons. Mm-hmm. Right. Not just one thing. So when I see George Floyd, I see my uncle. Mm-hmm. I don't care what he's done. Somebody got to advocate. And I think where we are right now in society, especially with black people, we finally like waking up and seeing, wait a minute. No, I'm going to advocate because that's my uncle. I'm going to advocate because that's my auntie. I'm going to advocate because advocate that's my cousin. Well, you're a doctor. Right. Amber, you, you've got it going on. You're married. You've got kids. Why are you getting? No, because somebody had to be about that life for me because if they weren't, Mm -hmm. what would have happened had you accepted less? I think this, this, this shroud of racism, and I've been talking Mm -hmm. a whole lot about the, the, the white evangelical church, their involvement, Mm -hmm. right? And now you're even uncovering this, this, idea of it being embedded in education mm-hmm. you know so the thing is deep it's, it's, it's deep it's so it's so deep it's it's it has to get to a place where you're willing and and being a medical being a person who's a doctor who's been involved in surgeries now's the time we got to take that that scalpel and we got to make that incision. That first incision is it's not going to feel good, especially if you don't have anesthesia. And the problem is right. with white people, I'm going to speak to you white people. Here's your issue. I have an anesthesiologist right here. You all <laughs> getting that scalpel cut 
with no anesthesia, yeah. no local. It hurts, doesn't it? Because y'all been sleeping yeah. for 400 years. Yeah. Y'all got to take these cuts. Real, that's real talk, you know. Um, I'm sure, Jason, you know, much like me, I'm sure you've experienced this too, um, you know, getting um, DMs and messages and text messages from well-intentioned white people, um, some who have been, who have been along for, in this struggle with us, and then there's some newcomers. And so I think we have to start by having some real conversations up front about I'm glad you're here now, but where have you been? Where have you been? Um, there have been, you know, I was looking back through some of some old videos and photos and I saw, I saw a video of my husband. He had my now five-year-old, she was not even one at the time, Jason, and he had her out at a Black Lives Matter rally. Um, this was five years ago. I did not know that they were there. And so when he got back, I was like, you have my baby up this Black Lives Matter. But my point of sharing this with you is that, you know, that was five years ago and here we are. Here we are. Here we are, right? Here We've been here, this is nothing new. And so I think, you know, when I, and I'm, and I'm a work in progress because part of me um, by nature, my giving nature um, can be mistaken as people pleasing. Um, but I think for, again, for the new, for the white people who are new to the, new to the struggle, you know, we have to have some real, um, real candid conversations about like, where have you been? What, you know, why now? What's different? Because this is not new. Um, this has been caught on, on video, but there've been other videos. This is, this is definitely egregious and George Floyd's death was egregious, but it's not the first egregious death. And so, um, so I think just, you know, trying to meet them where they are. And then the other thing is putting healthy boundaries on, on it. You know, you want to make sure that as Black people, we are protecting our own emotional well-being. Um, and at the same time, we realize that there's some time sensitivity to this. Like, it's just not enough to say, go read this book and come back to me in a couple of months. So how do we, ba you know, how do we balance our emotional well-being, wanting to help them, but also recognizing that we've got to put healthy boundaries on this. Like I can't return, I can't have this conversation with you every day. I'm available this day and this day, but you're going to have to do, you're going to have to come to the table to having done your homework and being, and having um, the heart of listening and openness. I will not engage with anybody to is not interested in, in a heart posture change. So if they're spewing, if they're spewing hate and they're spewing, um, you know, I just, I, I can't engage in that. You know, I have friends that'll go to battle with anybody and I just, I don't, I don't have the wherewithal. And for me, that's yeah. not, I just don't feel like that's what God wants me to be doing is engaging yeah. with people who don't want to be engaged. But if they want to be engaged and even if they don't get it right the first or second time, I'm open to it. But again, on my boundaries and on with healthy boundaries and acknowledgement for those who are, are new, like where have you been? And it's interesting because I love, you know, being, being a minister, right. And I'm being the things that I've been praying about and the things that the Lord is revealing to me on a daily basis, mm -hmm. just about who we are first and foremost. Right. And so when you talk mm -hmm. about the acknowledgement, the Bible calls that repentance. <laughs> mm -hmm. So when we talk about this whole idea of like how, how we engage appropriately, we have every right to say, where you been though? Where you been? What's up now? Right. What makes this different now? Right. You could, cause you got to answer that. You got to right. answer that and you got to come correct. Um, I'm curious to know, <clears throat> How and and you said how your your husband took uh, your daughter to to um, a Black Lives Matter protest five years ago, and last night my kids wanted to watch the movie Just Mercy, mm. and it's not that I think that we have been avoiding it, but I just 
you know, when the, when the subject matter is so heavy, it's like, you know, Stacy and I were just kind of like, ah, do we feel like watching this right now? But the kids really wanted to watch it. So we said, okay, we're going to watch it. Mm -hmm. And my son definitely had some reactions watching that movie because he lives, he lives in a world that's like, that's wrong. This is right. Why can't they just do this? And it'd be like that. And so last night was the first kind of real candid talk about the things within social justice and policing and mm -hmm. ju judicial system and and how I, I i spoke handedly about him about the ju the judicial system not just for black men we, i spoke about that but i said hey dude once you get in this thing it's a wrap yeah. when they put you on death row in alabama it's a wrap mm -hmm. no matter your like it's a wrap because inside of how they think this is warranted, we run, yeah. we run you. That's a sick, evil system. That's satanic. It's demonic. Yeah. No, no matter what the person did, the state should not be determining a person's life. Yeah. Period. And so just... How how are you engaging in conversations with your girls, even though they're they're younger? Yeah. How, this time, this is a time to really start. Like, okay, how do how do we talk? How do we have these conversations? And what do those conversations look like with you and your husband? Yeah, I mean it's it's been challenging. Um, so my daughters are five and eight, and there's part of me that does not want to paint their innocence and the way the lens is for which they see the world you know I, that really spoke to me about how your son was like it's right or wrong like they don't you know if that's just seen through like this beautiful innocence that god gives them as a child and it's Absolutely. not until you know it's not until sin and you know it's not until the lens are lifted and you see the sin and you see the battle of principalities that are that are real right as you grow older and you gain more experiences with with real life situations right so um it's it's challenging we, we you know they know about my oldest knows about george floyd's death and we've talked with her um more so than we have with the five-year-old the five-year-old is still um she's still trying to grasp race yeah you know, she looks um she looks at my mom who's um who's very who has a light complexion and she and she tells me she asks me why is grandma white and i'm like grandma's not white she is black she's just a different shade of black uh -huh. you know and so she's still young where she's just trying to really kind of wrap her mind around you know, white people, as she calls peach or beige versus, you know, all the different shades of black. And so we just try to keep her encouraged and, you know, say black comes in all different um, shades. Um, you know, she asks a lot of questions. Well, why did God make me like this? And why did he make Grandma Linda like this and make you like this? And I said, well, God makes people um, in in a lot of different ways and um, and we're to love everybody as as, as God has made them. So the conversations are a little um, are uh, a little heavier with the eight year old. We don't watch a whole lot of news in our house, so um, so in that way we're able to kind of control um, the messaging. But I do know that there are going to come there's going to come a time, especially when they go back to school, where these conversations are going to be um, going to be happening. I guess I'm just I guess part of me just wants to hold on to. I get see it. her innocence and, and to protect her yeah. from these difficult conversations. Yeah. Um, I get it. I mean, yeah, your, your kids are, yeah, your, if your oldest is eight, my oldest is nine, he'll be 10 this year. And my, my oldest is 12. So mm -hmm. even moving into that, you know, my daughter has a cell phone and it's, this is too much. You know, it's just too much. I'm not ready. It, I am it, not ready. See, yeah. Yeah. See that, that age is <laughs> eight and five. It's like, perfect like let's just run and get yeah. on the swing set and 
let's slide yeah. on the slide. Um, Absolutely. These these are things that are necessary. And I, I believe that um, it's individuals like yourself, like myself and like other people who are really doing the work and putting in this um, this time and energy. I want to um, ask you about about your husband. Now, I see he's a do- mm. he's a doctor as well. Uh, yeah, he's a Ph.D. So okay. he has a Ph.D. in counselor education. Awesome. So how did you guys meet? What's the story behind the Brookses? How did that <laughs> come to be? So Mike and I met when I was doing my anesthesia training in Birmingham, Alabama, of all places. And so my girlfriend and I, I had just moved there and she was helping me unpack um, a girlfriend um, from Chicago. And um, so we were out and we were out at the store one time and one day and we asked somebody like, you know, where can we go to take a break? Um, Cause it was July 4th weekend. And they said, oh, you should go to the Blue Monkey Bar and Lounge. I like to say that we met at a lounge. Mike likes it. He's like, Amber for real, it was a bar, like stop playing. <laughs> um, so anyway, you know, you, Blue, Blue Monkey Lounge or Bar or whatever, that's where we, that's we, gotta where change, we met. We got to change the name of that. We can't have Black people meeting at somewhere called a Blue Monkey. <laughs> the like, Blue Monkey, right? Yeah, like it's all, it's all kinds of wrong. And then you in the Birmingham, bar, Alabama. Like, <laughs> in Birmingham, Alabama. So, um, so we, when we first met, we actually, um, we just stayed friends. We ended up like going to the same um, church. We ended up having like the same social circle. Uh, and so anyways, we just became really good friends for the first two years that we, that I was there. And it wasn't until the last year, um, that I was in Birmingham that we started dating. By that time, I already signed an agreement that I was going to do my pain management fellowship at Cleveland Clinic. And so I knew, I knew I was leaving. I had done, done long distance stuff before and I was like, whatever, you know, like this is not going to work. Well, anyways. You should say, you never should say what you're, what's not going to work, what you're not going to do, because then you'll turn out to do exactly that. Long story short, we dated long distance for a year um, while I was living in Cleveland. We got engaged March 26th in Cleveland. There was still snow. I had snow boots on. Um, And anyways, I ended up moving back to Birmingham and I took a job at University of Alabama at Birmingham where he was working at well, as well across campus. And so we got married and then a year later we had our first, um, our first uh, girl. And then three years later, Mike got an opportunity to work at North Carolina A&T University. And so we relocated to Winston-Salem, North Carolina in 2013. That's awesome. I mean, there's some, yeah. that, that distance thing is, I mean, cause I met Stacy, Stacy's from Texas. And so, yeah. um, we actually met through, uh, a mutual friend who actually attended the same church. It's actually my pastor's daughter in Chicago. And that's how I oh, met nice. Stacy. She brought Stacy to church and then we became friends for two years, about two and a half years before we started dating. And when she graduated from Northwestern, she took a job in Cincinnati. And so Mm. she lived in Cincinnati and we were like doing the whole drive back and forth from Chicago, Cincinnati. And that just, just even thinking about that time, like, man, like I was always in the car. She was always in the car, but that's, (laughs) that's the thing about, you know, love and courting and developing a bond and, and like, that time like really helped to solidify like who we Mm -hmm. were and then so we'll be married 15 years in september wow it's been 15 years like it's crazy like time just that is awesome continues to fly by um i see that you guys are congratulations thank you thank you i see you guys are really into bike riding and it says here that you were triathlete like so tell me about this whole thing now. Like, where is this, like, super athlete, doctor, mommy thing coming in? Like, where is all this stuff coming in? How, how did you get the, the mindset to say, I'm going to go do a triathlon? 
So it's definitely been a journey. I didn't start off saying like, I'm going to, I'm going to do a triathlon. So, you know, I've always been really active and, you know, like James Harden and even at HF, I played basketball. So I've always been into um, sports. You and I are like diehard, diehard Chicago Bulls fans. Last so, dance, like, baby. I, I, <laughs> yes, yes, last dance. Um, so I've always been really active. And so in, it was like 2000, uh maybe 2011 anyways i was helping one of my aunts put together uh, a glucometer machine basically a machine to check your blood sugar or your glucose and it just like a light bulb went off and i was like oh my goodness i looked around at all of the women in my family and with the exception um of my mom everyone was overweight um they had multiple medical problems and even my mom um, even though she's not overweight she has high blood pressure and so something clicked in me and i was like yo i'm fighting some serious genetics here yeah. and i just want to make sure that i always try to prioritize my health and so at that point i started running so i ran for years i did a half marathon a few years ago and then age caught up with me and my knee was like yeah, I'm not going to let you be great. And so yeah. I, I'm going to have to shift gears because I was like, I'm still going to be active. Um, and for me, being active and exercising helps me blow off a lot of stress. And so I, I really like it um, for that reason. And so I said, I have to find something else. And so my husband and I, we decided to get bikes because he has a bum knee and he wasn't able to do a whole lot of running anymore. And so we got the bikes and we thought, okay, this will be cool because it's a but it's easy on our knees and it's something that we can do together. So that's how we got started with biking. I got the crazy idea to sign up for an entry level triathlon a couple of years ago, not even knowing how to swim. Like I, something, I just signed up hold for hold it. Up, and hold, up, like, hold up, hold yeah. up, hold up. You grew up at you didn't know how to swim? No, how did you, no, I'm how did you black, avoid taking swimming in high school? Oh, I faked my way through it. Like I was one of those black girls that like couldn't like breathe properly underwater, didn't want to get her hair wet. And so I just kind of faked my way through that. Oh, profile. okay. Six oh the six oh four. The six oh four. Yeah, I <laughs> no, the rest of them can swim. The rest of them can really swim well. Like Dana Michelle, Leah, like all of them can swim. I cannot swim worth a lick. I don't know how I made it through. <laughs> So anyways, I, I signed up for this track line. I cannot swim, but I'm going to like, I'm going to teach myself. Like that's my type A personality. Like I'm just going to teach myself how to swim. So one day I show up to this, the YMCA swimming pool and I get in there and I do some kind of like doggy paddle something. And I was like, yo, this is not good. Like I got eight weeks to learn how to swim. So I got out of the pool and I went and knocked on the um, swim uh, instructor's door. And I was like, hey. I signed up for a triathlon. I just realized I don't really know how to swim. I was like, can you, yeah, this is just true story. Like true story. This is how nuts I am. And um, I was like, I need some lessons because I need to learn how to swim in um, eight weeks. I signed up for this entry level triathlon. And she was like, okay. So anyways, she worked with me for like four weeks straight. I took lessons like three times a week. I would go to the pool two weeks on my own. And lo and behold, I learned how to swim and I did my first triathlon. That's a G right there. Oh, I mean, <laughs> let me tell you guys. It's a something. G or crazy, right? I don't know which one, probably but, crazy. But see, I, this is what I love about doing these types of interviews, talking to people, because this is, meeting people who are everyday people that do extraordinary things. It's not about celebrities. This is about people who say, you said, look, type A, I'm going to go ahead and don't tell me what I can't do. And, and what I love about black women, because <laughs> black women don't, if you tell a black woman with a strong personality, they can't do something, look out. My yeah. wife's the same way. My wife taught herself how to swim when we were on vacation. I think we were mm -hmm. in Hawaii. And she really was like, I'm about to be about this life right now. And I'm, I don't care. <laughs> Go in. And so now she can swim. And like yeah. be before it was like, well, let me show you, let me teach you. And it was like 
more resistance. But when she decided that she was going to do it, that's when it happened. She did it. She did. Yeah. And so, you yeah, know, that's a that's an amazing story. It's making me think about, OK, what have I said that I want to do that I haven't done, mm-hmm. but just haven't had the, you know, the light bulb hit and say, I'm going to figure this out until it right. happens. And I want to encourage anyone who's watching this, take that story and apply that to something in your life. Mm -hmm. You know, it may be going back to school to get a degree. It may be losing Mm -hmm. that extra 10, 15 pounds. It may be starting that business. It may be, you know, getting a close relationship with God. Whatever that thing is, you have to apply that. Um, Just a couple more things before we go. I see that you and a few of your um, colleagues have created Mm. something called C4PEMD. Yeah. Eating shrimp and grits the other day. I was a little jealous. (laughs) Um, Can you tell, can you tell everyone what is, what is this uh, organization that you uh, are a part of? Yeah, absolutely. So the four is a play on um, the letter A, so there's four of us, and so we um, we call it the Cape MD. And so basically, it's four of my um, dearest friends. We all happen to be Black female physicians, and we were inspired a few months ago after we met Oprah Winfrey um, on a God-given, like, we showed up with ex- huge expectations and regular seats at her Weight Watchers uh, tour. Um, back in January, I believe, and we ended up leaving, having met her, and it was just an amazing experience. Long story short, we decided that we wanted to pull our collective voices. We all are women of faith, we all are physicians, and we all felt like we were being called to a, a, a larger purpose, and so we um, want to bring We want to give voice to health equity and health disparities, um, particularly um, amongst communities uh, of color and with a focus, with a special focus on women's health. Um, So we are just getting started. Please follow us on um, Instagram and Facebook at the C4PEMD. And um, we are just looking forward to continuing this journey and we're open to follow wherever God leads us. That's amazing. Um, I want to leave you here with this last question is, um, is twofold. Um, I want to know what are you personally praying for, for your next, like what's the next thing that Amber is praying for, for Mm -hmm. Amber. And then what's the thing that you're praying for maybe as a collective whole? So what are those things that that you are praying for, believing God for? Because I want to stand in agreement with you as you pray. Oh, Jason, you ask the hard questions, don't you? (laughs) You know, this is just, this is, I'm diving into this thing. I'm, I'm finally understanding a part of my calling and my gift. And, Mm -hmm. and this morning, even as I was fixing my breakfast, God was like, ask her what her next thing that she's praying for. Cause there's something about your next that you may have been like, I don't know, this may seem too big. I don't know if being a director of this or that, I don't know. You know, so hearing you learning how to swim in eight weeks to do a triathlon, (laughs) I want to know what your next thing that you're praying for is because <laughs> put it out there because now's the time that we come together. The Bible says that when any two come together as touching, right, he will be in the midst and it will be done. Um, so absolutely. What are those things? That absolutely. You're for? So I need, you know, for myself, I have really been, um, thinking a lot about, so my Sunday school class yesterday with my church, we talked a lot about the difference between knowledge and wisdom. And so one of the things that I have been thoughtful about and in prayer about is 
just that God gives me discernment for the next big, greatest thing, right? Because as, yeah. as believers or as even as, as people, there's a lot of good things that we can be a part of. But what does God want you to do, right? And so in order to, you know, to hear, to hear God's voice, you have to be walking in alignment with your person, with, with your purpose. And you also have to be praying, praying for discernment to decipher which opportunity is best for you. So it's really funny that you, it's so, it's no, so it's not funny. I don't yeah, believe I in coincidences. Yeah. I always, you know what I'm saying? I always, like God always, something, things happen. So I just got an email today about a potential opportunity. So the fact that you would be asking me about what the next big thing is, is no coincidence, right? It's all, it's always like that. Yeah. Yeah. So be praying about this email that I got today. Be praying got for you. God's continued, continued um, discernment yeah. and wisdom about the next step. I think, you know, with regards to what I'm praying about in general, I, I just pray that the momentum that we have around social, social justice and racial um, injustice and police brutality, like I pray that we don't lose that momentum. I pray that everybody, every single person will find some small way to influence, to influence their, um, their networks to use their sphere of influence, right? I feel like sometimes with these issues, we feel we get so overwhelmed and we think, well, if I'm not at a protest or I'm not doing something like really big, that you're not doing anything. And that's not true. You, it could be just as simple as having, being open to having conversations with somebody and changing a heart. Um, yes. It could be as, as simple as providing I have a classmate from college who's been providing snacks for the protesters. So, I mean, there's just like, what, what is your, I just pray that everybody, every single person finds what their, what their contribution is to this, 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 uh, awakening to this, this new, this new revolution, you know, not all is lost in 2020. And I, I mean, I'm guilty for put, you know, for saying 2020 is trash, but you know, that's yeah. not true. Not all is, not all is lost in 2020. Hopefully we all come out of 2020 forever changed for the better. Right. Yes. So, you know, this time has just been amazing. It's been amazing to sit down and connect with you and just even what I see for you, uh, and your husband, I see you guys moving in the next level of a sphere of influence uh, where you guys are. Um, don't don't be surprised when God just moves you even to a new a new city, a new state. Um, mm -hmm. Don't be afraid of that. Um, mm -hmm. And the fact that you have each other right and your and your relationship is rooted in love it's mm -hmm. rooted in trust it's rooted in god and that there's no um there's no envy or jealousy amongst mm -hmm. your relationship and what right. you guys are becoming is an example that not just black lives matter i'm gonna start this new hashtag black wives matter right <laughs> Hey, I like that. Um, black, yes. love, black love. I, 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 yeah, it yes. all it all matters, and this this new season and this new awakening, you guys are a part of that, and you guys are going to be voices that people really, really need to hear and want to hear. So. Don't be surprised wow. when the phone starts ringing for more interviews. They're gonna see this. Oh my God, we have to have no oh, Dr. Amber Brooks. She's oh my gosh. <laughs> CNN and all that stuff. Oh. Like, don't be surprised. Oh my goodness. Friends. So, um, my friend, it's been an honor and a privilege to sit down and talk with you. Um, when you're in LA next time, please come over, have dinner. I'll fix yes. shrimp and grits. Um, I don't know if it'll be as good as, <laughs> as your girl, but uh, please, um, by all means. And everybody, thank you guys for watching this. Feel free to share it. Feel free to like it. Um, if they want to get in touch with you, um, Please let us know how to get in touch with you on social media, 
uh, Instagram. Or yes. Please let us know. So thank you, Jason, again, for this wonderful opportunity and for um, facilitating this really important conversation. I really appreciate